Let's move on for the next speaker, Dr. Hoda, who will introduce Dr. Amr. Dr. Hoda. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarwat. Um, now, last but not the least, we have um, with us uh, our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Amr Mahmoud Salam. He is a um, lecturer in anesthesia and intensive care in Ain Shams University. He is also a former fellow of neuroanesthesia and neuroclinical care in Beaumont Hospital. Uh, he is going to give us a lecture on a combination of two of the most difficult things, I think. It's the transfer and critical ill in his lecture, transfer of critically ill patient, um, Dr. Amr. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoda, for this lovely presentation. Thank you for the most brilliant, brilliant presenters we had today, uh, Dr. Nabil and Dr. Samir. Thank you very much. I hope that my lecture is not that it's, it will be as pleasant as theirs. Um, what I'm going to discuss today is one of the most important subjects. It's not an ICU uh, subject, it's not an anesthetic subject, it's not an, an emergency subject, it's something connecting all between. It's the transfer of critically ill patients, either from the, the place of the accident or the site of the accident to the hospital or other. I'm trying to collect between the enter and enter hospital, and we will discuss that. Nobody can argue that uh, the safest place uh, for the critically ill patient is the ICU. It's all the static state state of the patient with, with its monitor attached to it and the whole infusion in, in installed and attached. That's the most comfortable and the most easiest and the most suitable situation for the patient. And I think as well for the intensity. Although there are many situations when the patient must leave the unit. It's this secure surrounding and pre transferred either to another department like the interventional radiology suit or something like that, or to be transferred to another hospital. And at this point, I'd, I'd like to say why this subject is a little bit important. I think at some point in every physician career, he or she will be involved in the transfer of sick or injured patient. That is something that you will be starting. And I'd like to ask all of you about your experience in that. And we'll, we'll discuss that in a minute now. The points I'd like to discuss and share and very fast thing, I'd like to mention mainly four points uh, with us. What's the type and the terminology of the transfers and transport between each unit? What's the physiology of the transport and what's the risks and how to plan for that? And first of all, we'll go talk about the terminology. And we classify the transfer or transport of the patient between three main classifications. One of them is the enter and enter hospital transfer, which means the enter hospital is the transfer of the patient from, a, from an institution to other work, either for a specific treatment and then coming back or even for moving them definitely for this uh, um, unit. While the enter hospital transfer, which is the transfer between the hospital itself in the same institution, and that doesn't mean by side, it's to move the whole building. It might move, it might involve moving to outside, like MRI, which is usually situated out of the hospital, or from another building to another building, or even in the same building. And all of these have their own risk and has to be taken off and uh, worried about. And another types of transport we would like, I'd like to mention just it's the primary and uh, secondary transport. Primary transport is moving a patient from the site of the accident or the site of the scene of the incident itself um, to the hospital. And it's usually the nearest hospital uh, to the site. While the secondary transfer is moving this patient uh, from, from a, a hospital, a primary hospital, to more tertiary and sophisticated hospital for a specific treatment or intervention. Sometimes we have what we call extended primary transfer, where, what, which where we will move the patient from the site of the scene to a specific hospital that know that the patient will require this intervention, and we know that we need to that, and we would organize that with them. The last classification is about the indication of the transfer itself, uh, which is 
differs between clinical transfer, which is a transfer to a specialty treatment or investigation uh, that uh, present in the, in the refer doesn't present in the referring hospital. While there is what we call the capacity uh, transfer, which is to transfer the patient to a specific treatment or investigation still, but we have this service in the hospital that's referring him, but it, for some reason, it's not currently available either due to the capacity of the number of the patients admitted for that, or it's for a malfunction of the equipment. And the last one is repatriation, which is moving the patient after having this investigation or treatment done to him and moving him back to uh, the unit. And every one of them using an ambulance or using an air ambulance as well has its own risk, and it has to be considered and uh, discussed. Now let's move to another more medical subject, which is the effects or changes that happens during the land transfer. And uh, I'm just presenting a, a picture of uh, Sir Isaac Newton. I hope that we know all him well with his all three laws uh, of motion. And I'm mostly concerned uh, about the third motion of law, which is the easiest one that we know with everyone that is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I'll show you in the next few slides how, how that affects our physiology in uh, the patient side. So we're talking about the third law of motion and you can see with during the acceleration of the ambulance, I know it's a very simple ambulance, but with, there's an amp, uh, it states that the action has a, uh, for every action, it has an equal and opposite reaction. So when the patient is accelerated during the, the ambulance, there will be traction and external force that applied on the patient in his traction and restraint, as well as all non-tethered organs, like blood, for example, will move into the other side to the away from the direction of the movement. So if in, 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 in a state of, uh, in a state of uh, acceleration, for example, the external, like the whole force will need to move the blood to the leg, while in the brakes or during deceleration, all the other organs and every organ with its limitation to movement, but it will still moving up, causing an effect in the physiology of the patient. And the whole displacement will depend on the magnitude and the direction of acceleration, of course, and the direction of acceleration itself either can be anterior, posterior, lateral, or kefalo uh, coded. And let's see with every uh, with every point. So for with acceleration, for example, it would be easy that we have to know. And that after that, you would be explained a lot of changes that will happen during the transfer. So in, in uh, physiologic during acceleration, all of the blood will be moving and pulling in his legs and feet. That will lead to be decreased the venous return and leading to decrease the preload with a lower blood pressure. And if he, the patient is an enotropes or vasopressor, he will require more. And on that will affect mainly on the neurologic system. I would totally agree with someone who said, okay, it will lower the ICP as well. Yes, it might, but like the whole difference will be will be affecting like the lower the blood pressure effect, and that will lead to exacerbation of the neurosurgical condition if it's present. On the other side, and I think the most dangerous thing is the few, the consequences of deceleration. That will lead. It usually happens not as steady as the acceleration. It happens with the brakes. That will mean a huge amount of deceleration happened that will lead to a huge amount of increase of venous return. It might even lead to pulmonary edema, for example. Ne neurological effect, it might lead to increase of ICP. And if you monitor a patient with an ICP uh, and during the ambulance, you would notice the changes because it, the, the fluid state differs between the blood and CSF. The changes is very easily affected by that. For GIT, for example, the displacement of deceleration that will lead to the stomach displacement and increases risk of vomiting from these patients. While in, if the patient is lying in the muscular in lying flat on the on the stretcher itself in the ambulance, 
the whole deceleration might lead to displacement of a spinal uh, vertebrae if it's unstable. I just need to mention that all of these changes, the third law doesn't okay, only occur to the patient. We have to know that in the ambulance itself, there is a medical personnel that would still would follow the same law and the equipment as well. And I'd like to show you a video that would show an ambulance accident. And I just leave it for you. I hope that it's keep working now. Yeah, I just need to tell you that the, the crash accident, this crash is happened by, by force of 45 kilometers per hour. It's not a high thing. The whole statistical findings in United States, for example, it was in, in 2017. It mentioned that the ambulance cars had 6,000 accidents that cost United States about $500 million in, the, in that year. It's a huge number. And it affects the safety. I don't. I don't think. I don't. I see that in the video. It's not a pleasant thing that the patient will find a, a nurse or a doctor lying over him, eighty kilograms or something like that. Other effects uh, I'd like to detect, the, to discuss and mention is about three main things. Noise. It's very unpleasant for a patient that he's been transferred if he's awake or conscious, of course, but. If he's not, it's very difficult to communicate with your team if you are present. Like if there's two or three lying there, it's totally difficult to be able to communicate or giving orders or following orders as well. Temperature, it's very difficult even inside the corridors of the hospital or inside the ambulance to control the temperature like uh, in the unit itself and in the room usually would ask you to get more uh, blankets or more warmer warming devices by any means and to prepare uh, prepare for that transfer as well something that nobody cares about and doesn't worry a lot but we find we will find it very very important is the pressure areas and, and pressure sores Pressure areas need to be monitored and to be secured during transfer. All I, I know that all every one of us has seen a stretcher, and you know how it's hard it is, and how the spine protectors, for example, is very hard as well during prolonged transfer. And there was a study, a small study that been done on a normally uh, volunteers about lying for about twenty minutes, and they noticed after twenty to thirty minutes that there has been changes in their to their skin and to their uh, pressure areas. You can imagine that with a critically ill patient with a low block pressure on a vasopressor and uh, all of that. Um, changes can be happen more quickly, of course. And for this reason, extraction board, for example, shouldn't be used for wrong transfer. And we have discussed that. In the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, I think that was in 2013 in a pre-hospital Still, a spinal immobilization, they moved all from the, uh, I don't know if you know about it, moved all from the extraction hard boards uh, to something called a vacuum mattress, which is used. It's a lovely mattress that can keep the patient stay still in, in, the, in his position and to keep in line that uh, in, uh, in that position for a long time. It has far away less pressure effect on, on the patient himself. So I just need to mention seven points, just seven points to keep it in your mind during the transfer. I'm not discussing the transfer yet, but just to say, um, you have to resuscitate your patients before the transfer. Keep, keep the head up. That will reduce 
the whole influence of the inertial forces uh, on the ICP and on the spine as well. D during acceleration of the patient, these are like what like we can say it's more like a tricks. During acceleration, you can raise the leg if you feel the blood pressure is dropping and you don't like to increase the vasopressor if he's on or just not to add any uh, during acceleration, that will help uh, as well. Risk of aspiration is very high. It might not be initially during the transfer of movement or at the event of deceleration, it might be higher. And even if the patient it doesn't fulfill the criteria for intubation, I'd like to have a patient on anti-emetic or even has a nasogastric tube to have has his gastric content uh, emptied. I, I'm not recommending that we fast him for a transfer or something like that. Usually the transfer doesn't happen in organizational manner or in a proper manner as well. Monitoring of pressure areas and temperature of these patients is a mandatory and has to be kept in your mind all the time. And then this is the thing, the most important thing as a physician in an ambulance, you have to discuss that. Everyone in the ambulance knows and believes that the fastest way is the most safe and the easiest way. It is in some manner, but a steady pace with a controlled deceleration and acceleration is the safest and not only for the patient, but also as well for the medical staff and, and the public. Um, I think this is one of the most grandiose slides I have ever met in my my life is quoting myself. Uh, and this is started in 2007 when I started my ICU and they asked me, and I was mocking myself asking what the worst thing can happen. But then after that, I stopped. And I usually before every transfer, I'd ask me the same question. What the worst thing that could happen to me or to the patient? And in fairness, that's, this, this was a question I think in 2012 in the fellowship exam. And it's very important to aim and to point to things to have in your point. And I discussed, I would classify the risks mainly into three main categories. As you see, it, it's either patient risks or it's staff not a risk, it would be staff factors or system factors. And we'll start with the patient risk. So the main things you would have to consider if the patient is in a high peep, I think the high peep, and I put it the first one because it's one of the things that you can, you will actually you won't be able to achieve. You will affect the patient. If patients are requires high peak, however clamping the tube you will do. However, what you once you transfer him from his own ventilator to a portable ventilator, the peep will drop, and that might affect the oxygenation. And then intubated patients by themselves, even if they're not having high peep, that carries a high risk. Post surgical patient with their own drains and everything, and we are still in this, what we call systemic inflammatory response after the surgery, that might increase the risk. Illness severity, however you would like transferring him for that reason or not, this severity of illness might affect the risks and increase the risks. And of course, comorbidities, for example, patients with a diabetes and he will be attached to insulin and you won't worry, you, won't, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to add, more risks for a patient with catheter infusion, for example, to be disconnected or something like that, or have These are the, what we can say, it's non unpreventable causes or risk for the patient. From this, from the next point, we're gonna discuss the preventable risks. And in fairness, the whole publications that I read about this subject, there is not a huge thing except one something is discussing an NHS, discussing about 250,000 transfer. And they found like 90% of the risks are preventable. Either it's from the staff or uh, it's from the, from the system itself. And for staff factors, uh, poor communication, poor communication either between the receiving and the charging unit, between the ICU team and the transferring team, between the transferring team and the receiving team, all of these points of communication has to be uh, discussed and mentioned and planned to do, to be done. Inadequate resuscitation of the patient. And this is the point I always, I, I would see all through my 
my presentation mentioned, it's one of the most important thing. Resuscitation, resuscitating the patient at every single point before movement is very important. However, it will happen. However, you, you are very well in your job, the patient will be worse during the transfer itself. Therapy disruption, of course, if you are planning for a transfer patient or doing a procedure, another one will take about three hours. At as minimum as we can, we'd like to disrupt the therapy of the patient. If there is any dose that has to be given during that, it can be if, if it's allowed, and if there is no contraindication for that. Unsecured devices. And you cannot imagine how many incidents I'm witnessed, I'm, I, I witnessed by myself about unsecured cannulas or uh, IV devices, how many uh, unplanned extubation of a patient just during transfer, either due to unsecure taping or improper taping as well, in adequate monitoring. And that was something that we will mention. Every monitor used in the ICU for a patient has to be moved with him. And if we are discontinuing one of the uh, of, of that whole um, to monitors, we have to discuss that. Let's say ICP, I, will, I, will I discuss the ICP monitor for this patient or not? Will I discuss a CVP? Will I discuss, I'll discuss any, any uh, monitor I will stop at this point. And then the last thing is the insufficient education. And actually it was mentioned in most of guidelines I have read, and I will mention it in a minute now, about that the, the, the whole team must be competent. Incompetent personnel in any of the transfer team will make a huge impact on the transfer as well. Let's go for the system factors. And system factors is something that we will try to, uh, to avoid as maxim as maximum as we can, but it might be not. For example, the length of the trip itself. So if you have a, to drive between two cities with because of the road is very hard to drive and you have to drive for four or six hours would you move that to an air ambulance and just left him airlift him or something like that they're the things that you have to mention and uh, to discuss while you are preparing to transfer equipment failure of course non charging the batteries it's always a, a huge thing and issue and most of the ambulance now and but this happens mostly in the intra hospital transfer when you are moving out the unit so you have to test these and you have to ch check your batteries as well ventilation of the patient um, although i think most of the hospitals even even in develop, developed country and developing countries as well, they might have some portable ventilator, but some for somehow it's very preferable for the anesthetist or for the anesthetist to have him manually ventilating the patient. And that will lead for a huge impact on the patient. It, it, it's not the optimum thing. Even for a short period of transfer, even for that, it's better to keep him on the same setting that he has been set on and he's comfortable on and he's improving on. You cannot by any means, however you can experience, you are not able to control the rate and the whole the tidal volume for these patients. The other thing is the complex environment of moving the patient out of the unit, either going through the corridors of the hospital or going to the ambulance and how all of that, and if it's not prepared, for example. And I remember I worked in one hospital that the, the, out, the exit for the hospital to the ambulance is half something that causes a very verbation in the, in the stretcher, and it causes a huge impact and fall off subjects from the, from the stretcher itself. And the last thing I'd like to mention, and just to keep it in your mind, it's a very important thing, it's lack of checklists. Checklists, since the first of 19 when it was invented, and it's in the late 90s that it's in, in, involved in our medical system, it improves a lot about in our outcome. And especially, especially in the transfer and the transport, checklist has its own impact. So the question is, how can we avoid it? How can we avoid all of these risks has been mentioned and what, what we can do is it the checklist is the whole answer? I, I, I don't know. And I, sorry for that. It just, I, I say, okay, risks cannot be avoided. 
it will happen. But risks can be reduced. And I said before that in the last review, they said like 91, 90 to 91 percent of the whole incidence is avoidable and preventable. So the question is, how can we reduce it? And this is, was part of the question as well that was asked in 2012, how can you reduce it? And I'd like to say it's only three main points that we can say. First of all, it's planning. Then I'll go for uh, personnel, who will be with you, who will be, who will go with this patient. And the last point is equipment. And I'd like to quote uh, from another gay person. It's uh, Benjamin Franklin, and he said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So let's go now and think about, okay, you have been told that you are responsible for transferring this patient for a reason. And then after you know about the whole steps of denial, no, I'm not going, and then anger that why am why it's me going, you have to go to accept that, that the situation will happen. And yes, from, from accept, I'll take the, the initial letters and we'll discuss. So first of all, assessment. And assessment of everything, assessment of the reason of the transfer, you'd like to discuss that. Why I'm moving this patient? Is there any other possible chance? I, I won't move that. It's not, it's not like denying that or you hate that. It's more important that it, it does it affect the patient or not. There is no solid evidence till now that transferring the patient properly affects its own. I have found any dang, anything about that. But still, it's safest for him to be stay in the static unit. Assessment of the staff you have. Assessment of yourself. It's not a pleasant feeling that you kept swarming, squirming in the back of the ambulance because you have to go to the toilet or something like that. Then the control. Control about every single point of that. Control about what the equipment we will bring and the, the whole thing. To control who the team will go. Are we have any who will be on control and charge of all of that? There is has to be a single person that is involved in every single step. Usually it must be the senior, the most senior personnel in the ICU who is controlling every single thing, including first of all is communication. Who is transferring this patient? How many people would, would be involved in the transfer itself? Are the receiving units are accepting him? Where exactly he's going to be? And then we'll start to evaluate the situation. Again, evaluating the patient. Does he need any more resuscitation? Evaluating the equipment itself. And then preparing and packaging, uh, preparing, of course, of the documentation, preparing of the whole required with any media that we need is like x-ray images, CDs for uh, for a CT scan or MRIs, any of these, that there any need of copies or not, and then packaging, packaging of the whole equipment, and that we'll discuss um, in a minute now. Then at the end, we'll go for the transportation. What's the sort of ambulance I'm having while I'm transferring this patient? Is it a proper ICU prepared and uh, in, with its own equipment? ambulance or just a, a simple ambulance. That differs and it will differ, it will affect your decision. Either you will take some equipment or not, or how the space will look like or you will get. The second, second point we'll discuss is the personnel. And the whole guidelines agree that any critically ill patients must be accompanied at least by two attendants. So even if he doesn't require a physician we might consider the paramedics that's moving is the second attendee with the nurse, for example. Usually the doctor and the physician should be accompanying this patient. If he's a critically, he's a critically ill and we are moving him either to an intervention or even for, us, for another unit to be kept or something like that. So what's, what will decide? How, what's the level? And I think the level of patient's critical care depends is the guide for us to decide with who will be transferred with the personnel who would accompany him. So 
a say, and that will be taken by a senior doctor. That's the decision. So is it a pediatric patient? That mostly will differ from an adult patient. A patient with a chest tube will differ from a surgical post-surgical patient, for example, to uh, with a chest drain or even with an abdominal drain as well. And before the departure now, what's after assigned by the senior consultant that you are accompanying the patient, you should be take individual responsibility for everything, every single personnel, every single equipment, what do you require and what not. Now, for the most important question that we would ask, and we always ask in during the emergency, who does need an anesthetic escort? And in fairness between us, because we are all mostly anesthetists and intensivists, I'd like to ask a different question. Who doesn't need an anesthetic escort? And these, need, these patients, I'd say, I divide them into main three. So the, the patients are likely not need to airway or ventilatory support. That's their condition by any means doesn't need an airway or ventilation. The second thing is like that cardiopulmonary station would be inappropriate. If you are representing a patient, like, um, a terminally ill disease, for example, he's still critically ill, but you're repatriating him to his hospital, for example, because that, and he's not on a ventilation. Why I would need an anesthetist with him? And patients being transferred to for acute definitive management for whom anesthesia support will not affect their outcome. So for example, if I'm moving a patient for a cardio, uh, uh, an angiogram, a coronary angiogram, he's not in pulmonary edema, but just has a chest pain. I don't need an anesthetist to accompany him. That will affect the whole situation in the hospital, the whole logistics as well, because I'm taking, I'm just taking a personnel from the team, making them less by one and just moving him to other place. Training and I'd like to, just to mention that training of these individuals, all the individuals involved in treatment and transferring these patients should be suitably competent, trained, and experienced in that. Proper training, and we have loads of courses that involves transferring patients. I'm not discussing the airway transfer, the air uh, transport enemy, because this is a very highly sophisticated. I won't be able to be involved that in 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 that talk by any means. It will take us two days to discuss that. But any other transfer, it must be you must be trained about that. Portable ventilators or portable defibrillation is different, a little bit different, and you have to be aware about that um, as well. Then the last point we would say is the equipment. And just to collect them in my head, I divide them to main two things. It's monitoring one of them, and the other one is the ABCD. And the equipment for monitoring, it's, as I said before, it's the same level as an ICU. If you are discontinuing one, you have to discuss that with your senior consultant and to, ma to measure what will happen, what will be the outcome if something happened. It needs to be established and secure. It should be the minimum, at the same time, it's more efficient. Mounted, usually we mount them below the patient because the, fall of, the risk of fall on the patient is very high as well because we're moving and a lot. It's either the same level or below the level that would be uh, established. Standard monitoring is, is mandatory. It cannot be less than that, but then you have to add any if the patient was uh, on of any of them. And that will depend on the, uh, according to each patient uh, state. Then equipment. And from equipment point of view, so I'll start with the airway. If either the patient is intubated or not on any other device or not. A specific, special design for these patient with the sizes, with appropriate sizes. I won't collect the whole the sizes, like from, from 82, from three to up to eight, for example, for a, a lady. No, I have to know if this patient is intubated, I might get a bigger, a smaller size by one and, and half, not a bigger size. You won't be able to intubate with a bigger size. 
And then we can go for any other devices. Any other devices. Uh, while the breathing, uh, for the breathing, we either to use a portable mechanical ventilator, and these should have as minimum a, di a disconnection alarm and a high pressure alarm. The ability to supply PEEP and various part oxygen concentration, yes, it might it might be needed as well. And breath vac uh, and back valve ventilation is always to be if there is any in case of any failure. So for circulation, for example, we have to involve a proper IV access, a replacement for that, IV pumps if we need it as well. The drugs, adequate supplies of necessary drugs, prefer proof, uh, prefer, prepared beforehand of a brief syringes. If the patient has infusions, uh, we have to keep them prepared, double the doses, established on the medication used be during the transfer and before the transfer. If there is any plan to give us, as, like an antibiotic or something like that, it shouldn't be delayed. If there is a time to give that, you better to give that as well. Then E, we're gonna discuss um, the exposure about the patient. What will be the restraint of this patient? For a child patient, the restraint would be totally different from an adult. We don't have a proper, I have never seen a proper uh, stretcher for a child. Usually we use restraints to keep, keep children on the adult, uh, structure as well and then the the equipments which is that in the equipment point we have the frequent encounter it's please care about yourself a company stuff should wear a suitable warm and protective clothing usually we'd ask for a high visibility jackets with reflective you don't know if you would be stopping the road or something like that a mobile terms a mobile phone and the contact phone numbers from the receiving unit and the, and the discharging unit as well, because you might need to return back. Before I finish, I just need to mention this. This is the most important point. Checklists should be used and to help. These are mentioned in all guidelines. The NICE guidelines, the Intensive Care Society guidelines, and before each stage, I worked in a PATS, an IPATS, which is a pediatric transfer here in Ireland, and we had a checkpoint, a, ch a checklist before leaving the hospital to get a patient, before leaving the base itself and during in the ambulance. And before once we are there and after we check in the patient and we get them, we have a checklist as well. It can be simple as this is the simplest form. Are you ready for departure from the base and destination? And at the end, is the patient stable for transport or not? Highly sophisticated checklist, which is most important. And that would be, would be a very good quality improvement project in your hospital, is to have a checklist that's available on the online system as well. And um, just and just the thing. And I remember, a quote, I quote uh, uh, Dr. Atul Gwanda, who's invented the checklist in the whole health system that he said checklists I know checklists are boring but that is worse uh, as well so the the points I'd like to say at the end is transfer of kill, critically ill patient is still linked with avoidable incidents I as well checklists I repeat again are boring but death is still worse proper planning competent well-trained personnel and minimum needed sufficient equipment and drugs. And this is the last st statement. And despite the existence of the guideline, the transfer of critically ill patient is still linked with avoidable incidents. And I, as I mentioned before, one study mentioned 91% of the whole incident that is documented is where for uh, avoidable uh, reason. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your help and for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Ram, for the interesting, detailed, and uh, uh, summarized yet informative lecture. We have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. The first is from Dr. Nabil Askalani himself is asking, is there a difference oh. when transferring a patient by a helicopter uh, than transferring a patient with a fixed wing plane? <clears throat> Sorry, can you repeat again the question, Dr. Hada? Yeah. Uh, does it differ when transferring a patient using a helicopter than using a fixed wing plane? I think it's the different type of uh, transfer. Oh, yeah, it, it, uh, in fairness, it differs a lot. So 
uh, from a logistic point of view, the, the choppers or the helicopters is far way smaller and narrower uh, from the location itself. It doesn't have the effect of the acceleration and deceleration. We noted the acceleration and deceleration effect on the patients, mainly with the fixed wing uh, planes. These the, you have the huge acceleration thing, and, and that, that's one of the critical moments in the transfer as well. In the chopper, we cannot hear each other. Like the whole logistic thing is like a nightmare and uh, it's most, most most painful. Although it's very interesting in fairness. Uh, while the, with the fixed wing, if you have a proper plane, it's still it's narrow, but you might have the whole equipment present and e feasible to get. Thank you for this. Another question, if you don't mind, from Ahmed Mohammed Mahmoud is asking, uh, unpaved roads, unpaved roads during uh, inter-hospital transfer, uh, do they affect the head trauma patients? Unplanned, sorry? Unpaved, um, if the road is not paved well, like it's not, it's like not helping the ambulance going up and down. <laughs> uh, I, I cannot mention that I ha I've read something about that. It's, in fairness, it is affected. As we, as we said, the whole movement itself, it might affect the patient. Does it cause a displacement in, a, in unstable fractures in the vertebrae? It might be, there is no, nothing is mentioned like that. And you cannot blame that uh, as well. Uh, other than that, I, I, I cannot mention that it's, it's something specific, but of course it's, as I said, I noticed that in a patient with an exit uh, from some of a hospital, we had this unpaved um, exit and the patient is usually moving and the whole narrative, it might fall, it might cause a fall or something like that, yeah. This will lead to the next question. Uh, how should we investigate a patient who had a fall during transfer? Complicated things more. Oh, this is, this is, this is a very nice question in fairness. And I just, I just need to say something. I didn't have the time. Transfer of like, as Dr. Askalani said in his in his talk about the documentation in the ICO, this is the least moment that we had the documentation in the transfer. Documentation is very important, and it's our responsibility. It's the most senior personnel responsibility during the transfer that he has to check every single point. Falling of a patient. However, it happens. It still be blamed for the physician because he doesn't have the proper strain or something like that. But we cannot blame, and nobody can blame anyone because if you don't have a checklist, for example, that will lead to lose of all of these points. Mm -hmm. So you have to be clear about that. Falling of a patient, it's your job to check on it. Yeah, it might be the nurse work to do or the or someone to do for uh, to restrain the patient, but still it's your job to check on it. You are the most senior person there. Okay. Uh, the last question we have, uh, if a patient has a pneumothorax, could this patient be transferred by plane? Yes, the, the end answer of this question, yes, he can be transferred, but like it should be treated. And this is part of resuscitation and stabilization of these patients. I can, I won't, I won't move a patient to another unit far away by two meters if the patient has a pneumothorax. I won't move him from another room to other room, no. Stabilization, yes, I know what you mean. And this is a very difficult topic. The air transport itself with the ventilation and everything, yeah, it's, it's a very pressure. difficult, the yeah, a, a very pressure. huge topic. But still, we can move him if we have our precautions. And you have to stabilize the patient first mm -hmm. to put a chest drain, to put something, yes. Okay, I think this was our last question. Thank you very much for the lecture and for asking the question. Um, I have a question for Dr. Amr, if you don't mind, Dr. Oda. Oh, thank you. Go on, Dr. Tawad, yes. Okay. Um, I know that, yes, uh, I agree with you that uh, transferring the uh, critical ill patient is a challenging uh, situation, either interdepartmental or uh, interhospital transfer, yes. And uh, what I would like to know from you, uh, uh, if you have any um, guidelines for uh, transferring the critically ill, unstable patient, 
I mean, the scenario, what we are facing uh, every day in, in the ICU, that we have a shocked patient on high dose of vasopressors, and he has uh, ARDS, for example, uh, on high levels of FiO2 and high PEEP. Uh, so, um, and this patient needs a, a transfer, like department, interdepartmental transfer, either for diagnostic procedure or for therapeutic uh, procedure. So, is there any objective parameters to depend on for transferring such patients safely to the other department? In fairness, I, I, I like the, the whole guidelines, and there's a, the problem is we don't have a proper international guidelines except the, inter, the intensive care society, but like every single like the NICE guidelines for UK, the Irish Society guidelines has their own guidelines. And, but all of the guidelines agree that the patient must be stable. And like, for example, if you're seeing if a senior consultant of the unit asking for transferring of this patient, and he's asking a personnel and this personnel doesn't, is not happy to transfer this patient because he's unstable for some reason, he would be asked what you would need better. Increasing the doses of vasopressors as well, it might be whole thing the whole thing i'd say about that because we have we uh, that's something a situation we face every day but like yeah. if the patient is unstable i won't move him if he is stable on these high vasopressors and these uh amotropic support and i mentioned that he's stable in that for about four to six hours i would move him on that very slowly very carefully yes it's not it's it's not a guideline there is no guideline to mention that but still that's our practice if his anotropic support and vasopressor has lasted the same for the last four hours for example we say yes we are happy to move him if we know and this is the point about evaluation and assessment does this intervention will improve this outcome or not exactly so yeah, yeah, this is, I agree with you totally because uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, there is no guidelines for that, no objective parameters to depend on for transferring such patients, but rather than it is just to think about safe transfer for the patient, rather than a guidelines to depend on uh, for transferring such patients. It is a risk benefit ratio for uh, uh, the reason for transfer rather than anything else. Sometimes it is a case by case scenario, and sometimes you are mm -hmm. taking a consent just for transferring such patients and explaining the risks and benefits uh, for the family. Uh, because, yes, really the situation is very difficult in, in, in some patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Amr. Thank okay, you. I had uh, please. A couple more questions. Dr. Just a little question to Dr. Amr, please. Uh, yeah. As regards uh, patients with pneumothorax, an underwater seal should be put first. Secondly, as regards transferring the patients, if it's very critical, if you've got no other alternative, you've got to transfer him. Apart from this, we've got in Egypt air hospitals that could be sent to the scene of the accident and they can work on ground. It's available here in Egypt. Uh, concerning the helicopters, the helicopters fly one to two kilometers height. It's exactly like the ground ambulance. So any patient could be transferred with the helicopter, but the equipment within the helicopter are airworthy or airborne so that they wouldn't be affected by the instruments of the plane and they wouldn't affect the plane. As regards the fixed wing planes, if it's a long distance, they are pressurized planes. So no risk from transferring the patient as far as they are pressurized planes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Nabi. Don't mention it. And all Our those who are working in aviation medicine have got a master of science in aviation medicine because it differs from uh, yes, the ordinary yeah. okay mm -hmm. thanks a lot for your fascinating lecture no thank you very much for the for that uh, for that talk. and you are always our, our tutor in that subject specifically thanks a lot thanks a lot a uh, couple of more questions dr amr one of them i think you already answered um, a question is if the patient is in septic shock and more adrenaline and dopamine and need transfer to another hospital i think you answered this in the previous question uh, one last question is, uh, does air ambulance affect ventilator settings? Yes, it, it, it does affect. And for some sort, we have, like, as Dr. Nabil, and I think Dr. Nabil would be better to answer this question better than me, uh, because 
and he, uh, that's one part of his expertise in fairness but from my experience itself the the pressuring thing and all of that it's a huge impact and a huge subject that has to be discussed in a total lecture it's a very interesting subject and yes it has to be different and there is a specific people and as dr nabil said moving patients from for primary transfer from the site of the scene to the hospital it's a mandatory that's what that's we are not discussing about when we define a, a, a critically ill patient that means that the patient is in a unit and he we did somebody saw him as a physician and declared that he is a critically ill yes. uh, the you. ventilator the ventilator as far as it's airworthy or airborne it won't be affected by heights mm -hmm. we've got special ventilators for the plane mm -hmm. not the ordinary ventilator so it yeah. won't be affected okay we can even transfer a patient with uh, cardiac attack, myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. But I would like to add one point. If we're using fixed wing planes and the patient with plaster of Paris, we should dissect this plaster of Paris because the entrapment of air might cause gangrene to the limb. This should be put in mind. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Dr. Amr. Thank you, Dr. Nabil, for uh, uh, helping us with answers. Thank you very much for this. I think we're done with Dr. Amran with the question.